Well, hello and welcome to River Valley Online. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning or whenever you're tuning in. I just want an announcement for you this morning. We'd like you to be aware of a school supplies drive that we're doing through our local missions here. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different this year because it's actually better uh, to give financially than it is to give supplies. We can buy the supplies in bulk um, at, a, at a cheaper rate. So we're asking you to not give the items, the pencils and the erasers and such, but actually to give monetarily to this. So the way that you would do this is to either write a check and put in the memo line, school supply drive, or you can give online through our Alexio platform and you can indicate that in a comment there. That goes to support. Uh, we're gathered with other churches here in town and other uh, organizations that help uh, kids right here in Watertown. So this is a school supply drive right here for our local kids. So we'd love for you to financially give to that. Well, let's pray as we begin our time of worship. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would bless our time. Lord, I want to lift up schools to you. God, as, as schools all over this state and all over this country and, and Lord, right here in Watertown, Lord, as they try to decide what it's going to look like for fall and as they wrestle with, with varying opinions and, and looking at, at data and, and science and, and trying to do what's best genuinely for children and teachers, I pray, Lord, that, that you would give grace and mercy and patience and love. Lord, I pray that we as a church community would not uh, add to Lord, any problems, that we would be a voice of encouragement to those teachers and educators. Lord, that we would genuinely want what's best for kids and teachers and everyone, Lord, because that's what you want, is what's best. Lord, and so we just put it all at your feet and we say, Lord, you can have it. You show us what to do, you tell us when to do it and where to do it. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to River Valley Alliance Church. Let's sing together this morning. When the sea is calm and all is right When I feel your favor flood my life Even in the good I'll follow you even in the good, I'll follow you. When the boat is tossed upon the waves, when I wonder if you'll keep me stay, even in the storms, I'll follow you. Even in the storms, I'll follow you. I believe. Oh, I believe in everything. That you say you are and I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things in the hardest part I believe and I will follow you I believe and I will follow you When I see the wicked prosper, when I feel I have no voice to sing, even in the want I'll follow you, even in the want I'll follow you. I believe, oh, I believe in everything that you say. Hardest part, I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. When I find myself so far from home. And you lead me somewhere that I don't want to go Even in my death I'll follow you 
Even in my death I'll follow you When I come to end this race I run And I receive the prize that Christ has won I will be with you Sing, I believe together. Oh, I believe in everything that you say you want. I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things, in the hardest part. Oh, I believe and I will follow you. I believe in everything that you say. the hardest part I believe and I will follow you I believe and I will follow you Bless the song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the Lord bless the Lord oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to. Your name is great and your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, bless the Lord
worship you this morning. We worship you because you're good, because you're a good father, because you're a good savior, because you lived and you died for us to give us life. And God, we praise you for your goodness that never stops, that never leaves us, that never forsakes us. God, that you're always with us. We, we thank you. We worship you this morning. Let's continue to sing about God's goodness. As we sing goodness of God this morning, let's think about how good he is, even in the midst of the storm and the trials and whatever you're going through right now, but that God is good, that he's faithful.
Well, it is hard to believe, but I'm in my eighth year of pastoral ministry. It seems like just yesterday that I walked out of Watertown High School for the last time as an employee. Ministry wasn't something I was, was, was something I was called to do as I was graduating from high school. But God didn't call me to it as a profession until I was 50 years old. I know now that this call was delayed because God had some work to do on my faith foundation. Fast forward from 1976 to 2010. I distinctly remember the feeling as I was standing outside of Elmbrook Church in Brookfield where I was going to have a meeting with a representative from uh, Trinity Divinity School and I would begin my journey towards a master's degree in ministry. I remember my thoughts. <laughs> what are you doing? You're crazy. You are five years from a comfortable retirement. You don't know nearly as much about the Bible as other people do. The thought of preaching makes you nauseous. And the idea of being at the bedside of someone who is gravely ill or dying is the last place you would ever want to be. But my life experiences to that point, the foundation of faith that God had built for me over the past 30 years, had now resulted in a clear and concise call from the Lord. So I kept the appointment, even though I was this close to turning tail and going to McDonald's for a Big Mac. We've been looking at portraits of faith of people of God from the Old Testament. Today our portrait of faith is Queen Esther. As a girl, Esther was taken to the palace of King Xerxes and rose up to become queen of the Persian Empire. Esther bravely worked to save her people the Jewish people in the Persian Empire from annihilation. The lesson we learn from Esther is that as we live in faith, God will use all of our past experiences, both good and bad, to strengthen our faith. As we've been noting, wherever there is faith, there is a call from God to move forward. In Esther, we're going to see that the move forward for her and for us is to do the next right thing. Would you pray with me? Father, as we open your word now, I pray that that, that word and the power of your spirit would make us to be the people that you want us to be. May the words that I'm about to speak in the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in the story of Esther, there are four main characters. First, there's King Xerxes, and he is the king of Persia. Uh, now, uh, King Xerxes is someone that you would never have wanted to disobey because nothing good would come of such stupidity. His first wife, Queen Vashti, found this out when she refused an invitation to come to the king when he summoned her. Maybe she had a headache. But as a result, King Xerxes banished her from his presence. So the search for another queen began. In this search, they found Esther. Esther was taken from her home and came to live in the palace in the king's harem in this search for a new queen. She was Jewish, but she was advised to never reveal her nationality or her family background. God gave her great favor in the palace. She caught the king's attention, and she soon became queen. Another character is Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's older cousin, so he too was Jewish. Mordecai had adopted and raised Esther after her parents had died. 
Even after Esther had been taken to live in the king's palace, Mordecai continued to advise Esther and check on her safety. Mordecai was also instrumental in uncovering a plot to assassinate the king. As a result, the king became aware of Mordecai's loyalty and his devotion. Well, every good story has a, a villain, and this story's villain is Haman. Haman was a government official. He was a, a lifelong enemy of the Jewish people. Haman's pride and lust for power drove him to hate anyone who would not bow down to him. Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman. As a result, we see the size of Haman's ego as he seeks revenge on Mordecai by devising a plot to kill not only Mordecai, but all of the Jews. So Haman goes to the great king, and he basically pitches it as a revenue stream. He says, let me commit genocide against all of God's people. I'll plunder all of their possessions, and I will give you a 50% increase in the tax base for this year by giving all of the income to you. What a lovely man. The king greedily signed the decree, and the date was set. Death was on the horizon for all of God's people. Esther finds out about this. And because the man that raised her will be a victim of this Holocaust, she's concerned. Now, it must be said that I'm not so sure Esther has been a necessarily faithful, godly Jewish woman. She's been married to the king for four or five years, and no one knows, including her husband, that she is Jewish. This indicates that she has not been living in obedience to the Scriptures. Now, Esther's situation kind of reminds me of this idea. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If Esther had been on trial for being Jewish, there definitely would not have been enough evidence to convict her. No one even knew that she was Jewish, including her husband, the king. So, Esther, in hearing that the death sentence had been issued, now turns to God. Kind of reminds me of another old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes, or a more modern version of that would be, there are no atheists on turbulent airplanes. Mordecai reminds Esther that because she's Jewish, her head will also be on the chopping block. This seems to stir up Esther's dormant faith. Let's look at Esther's story in Esther, chapter 4, beginning with 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're the, in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. I want to pause for just a moment in the telling of Esther's story and see just what faith principle is at work here. 
In the Old Testament characters that we've looked at so far, each story has shown a rock-solid concept that is a component of a foundation of faith. Rahab, the first person we looked at, learned that, that even in her life as a prostitute, God was pursuing her. Gideon learned that even though he was vastly outnumbered, God was with him. Today we see Esther. I believe from the, from the story of Esther that we can add another block to our faith foundation, and that is the absolute fact that God wastes nothing. The blood flowing through Esther made her Jewish. But she, even though she wasn't living a Jewish life. Now, this is a personal opinion, but I don't think Esther would have caught the king's eye if she had not used some of her feminine mystique to attract the king's attention. The details of her becoming queen are the stuff of which not-so-nice romance novels are made. Her story might not be included on the Hallmark Channel. She obviously was not living a Jewish life dedicated to the principles of God. But God is not going to waste Esther's Jewishness. He's also not going to waste her connection with the king, even though it probably began in sin. God is going to use both of these things for his purposes, for the good of his people's purpose, and also for Esther's good. Bill Wilson, Bill W., the founder of AA, says, In God's economy, nothing is wasted. Through failure, we learn a lesson in humility, which is probably needed, painful though it is. I like what Toni Sorensen adds to this statement. She says, In God's economy, nothing is slag." Nothing is wasted. Every relationship we build is a teacher. Every experience we have is a coach. In every scar, there is a lesson. This idea makes a clear statement about the difficult, disappointing, and bad aspects of all our lives. Those aspects, those bad aspects, are not wasted. Consider for a moment what the scriptures have to say about our tough times. James 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials and tribulations are never easy. But God uses them to build up our faith foundation. Afflictions are painful. But God not only brings comfort he, comfort, he uses those experiences in our lives for us to see and experience that he is always with us. The pain and loss we experience, God uses to enable us to be vessels of his comfort and ministry to others. In God's economy, nothing is wasted. One of my favorite names for Jesus is Redeemer. It reminds me of how we used to save green stamps when I was a boy. If you were born uh, prior to 1990, you have no, I'm sorry, after 1990, you have no recollection of what a green stamp is. The stamps were not really worth anything, but if you got enough together, you could redeem them for all kinds of cool things. These days, it's like winning tickets at an arcade. You can trade them in for candy, toys, or stuffed animals. It is the practice of trading something without any real value and exchanging it for something that has value. That is what redemption is. When the Redeemer 
When Jesus redeems us, the, the brokenness of our lives is exchanged for something very valuable, something that has eternal value. Every difficult, painful circumstance, every trial and tribulation, every grief and loss are all used by God in our lives and sometimes even in the lives of others. He uses these things for good, taking that which is hard and even bad and redeeming it all for our benefit, the benefit of others, and most importantly, for his purposes and for his glory. God decided to show his redemptive power to Esther. For Esther, this was going to be difficult. This would be trying. This would be potentially lethal. Esther could only do this if she had faith that God was working for her. You don't say, if I die, I die without faith. That brings us to the second part of our main concept for this series. Faith always comes with a call. As Rahab responded to God's pursuit of her, God called Rahab to conquer her fear. As Gideon learned that God was with him, God called Gideon to conquer his enemies. And now, as Esther learns that nothing is wasted in God's economy, God calls her and God calls each of us to do the next right thing. Back to the story. So taking her life in her hands, Esther goes to the king without an invitation, a big no-no. But by God's grace, the king welcomed her and asked, how can I help? This is the more, most important moment of Esther's life. Perhaps you've figured this out as you've lived. In our lives, not every day is of equal importance. Not every moment is of equal importance. Not every opportunity is of equal importance. There are most definitely times where the Holy Spirit shows us that something urgent is up. It's, okay. it's an occasion that we must not miss. These are the moments where we must do the next right thing. For such a time as this, Esther is going to do the next right thing. She's not looking at the chance that she might die. She's not looking at the chance that she might suffer. She's looking out for the fate of others and the urgent situation that is before them. So, to briefly sum up what happens next, Haman is outed. The king figures out that Haman only wants what's best for Haman. The story becomes quite graphic as Haman is impaled, skewered on a pole that Haman had actually intended for Mordecai. I love the justice part of that story. Moving on, let's pick up the story in Esther 8, beginning with verse 3. Then Esther went again before the king, falling down at his feet and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman the Agagite against the Jews. Again the king held out the gold scepter to Esther, so she rose and stood before him. Esther said, If I please the king, and if I found favor with him, and if he thinks it is right, and if I am pleasing to him, let there be a decree that reverses the orders of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, who ordered that Jews throughout all the king's provinces should be destroyed. For how can I endure to see my people and my family slaughtered and destroyed? Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I have given 
Esther, the property of Haman. And he has been impaled on a pole because he tried to destroy the Jews. Now go ahead and send a message to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's signet ring. But remember that as what already has been written in the king's name and sealed with the signet ring can never be revoked. So on June 25th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai directed. It was sent to the Jews and to the highest officers, the governors, and the nobles of all of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. Skip down to verse 16. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness and were honored everywhere, in every province and city, wherever the king's decree was, arrived, the Jews rejoiced and had a great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do to them. Esther did the next right thing. And as a result, a Jewish holocaust is averted. I wonder, I wonder if there was anyone called by God to stand up against Hitler who didn't listen, didn't obey that call from God. Someone who had a solid foundation of faith and was called by God, but decided for whatever reason to be disobedient and not obey their call from God. Granddaughter Anna age four, going on 12, is really into Frozen 2. I'm not sure I've stayed awake through the entire movie, but when she's been watching it at our house, my ears have perked up when I hear the character Anna sing, do the next right thing. In the movie, Anna sang the song at a moment of crisis. And following the song, She does do the next right thing, even in the midst of her grief. But here's the thing. Maybe you're like me. When I'm overwhelmed, I often don't want to do anything. I see the numerous tasks before me. I feel paralyzed. When I'm exhausted, emotionally drained, powerless, and afraid, I'm helpless. When my past mistakes come flooding in my memory, I just want to mindlessly scroll on social media or sit in my recliner and watch a stupid sitcom. I don't want to listen to God's call. I don't want to listen to God's call to visit someone. I don't want to answer that nasty email. I don't want to even pray or seek counsel from anyone. While we need rest and relaxation, we must never use it to avoid doing what God is calling us to do. We must remember that do the next right thing is a call. And it's by no means a promise that the toughness of life is going to ease up. But it's a principle that helps us live more obediently to God's call. So the logical question is, what is the next right thing? Well, for me, the most obvious one is don't sin. For believers, the Word of God provides the unchanging standard of right and wrong. Sin is sin. It is never It is never the right thing. But in other callings, it's a bit more difficult. There can be many good and right things. How do we choose? That's when we must rely on the Holy Spirit to guide us. As we walk by faith, we must also walk by the Spirit 
to do the right thing. To do the right thing at all times. You know why? Because mama said there would be days like this. There are days in all of our lives when we will make a decision that alters the course of our entire life. There are days when we will stand outside the principal's office trying to figure out a way to say what God has called us to do. There are days when we will hear news about our health or the health of a loved one that we don't want to hear. There are days and moments where sin will be right in front of us, enticing us. There are days when we won't be able to stand the sound of the person's voice that we have pledged to remain faithful to forever. There are days when we'll be, we will be tempted to hate instead of choosing love. These are the days we must remember what Esther learned that is vitally important. In God's economy, nothing is wasted. Even if we have the faith the size of a teeny tiny mustard seed, it will not be wasted. Even if we have faith as large as the Pacific Ocean, it will not be wasted. One drop, won't it? And because of that faith, big or small, God will issue a call that we must answer, that we must obey. And that call will always begin with doing the next right thing. You see, my friends, in God's economy, COVID will not be wasted. In the midst of this pandemic, we are called to show God's light and love. In God's economy, racial intolerance will not be wasted. Even in the midst of hatred, followers of Jesus are called to love and act in the best interests of others. In God's economy, the insecurity of our time will not be wasted. As things swirl seemingly out of control around us, followers of Jesus are called to be beacons of hope. In times where things are insecure, followers of Jesus are called to be sharers of truth, the one and only truth. In out-of-control times, followers of Jesus are called to be lovers of everyone. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you have loved us. You love us with a purpose, and that purpose is for our good. So Lord, as you work on our faith, as you bring us to, the, to, to position our faith to be it the way that you would like it to be, Lord, would you make it obvious to, to us what you're doing? May we incorporate that boulder in our foundation. And then as we hear your call of what we are to do next, Lord, would we obediently and quickly obey so that your name will be lifted high, that you will be glorified in all of the earth and to the ends of the earth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my Without you, 
find yourself today, God is with you. God is above you, watching over and protecting you. He's beside you, being your friend. He's in front of you, showing you the way that you should go, calling you to go in that direction. And if you're not going to be faithful in doing that, he'll, he'll give you encouragement. And, and if you mess up, he's going to pick you up when you fail. Above all, God is going right here in, in the heart of all of his followers, all of his children, giving peace. Peace that the world doesn't understand, but followers of Jesus, we get it, and we've got to share it. Share that peace with everyone you come in contact with this week. Amen. God bless you all.